Well, dear graduating class of 2004, honored guests, parents, faculty and administration, and friends, these are the people who are going to look after us when we grow old. <laughs> um, now we celebrate, I guess, the fact that 271 people will now have to ask permission to enter the building now. So we got rid of you. I, I, when I was asked to speak at graduation, I was really uh, honored and, and really humbled. Uh, and I was a bit puzzled for a while at why I was asked. Um, because I wasn't really sure what I really could offer and what I could say. You see, um, after all, I'm really only 41 years old. Um, I, you know, in terms of wisdom, I have not yet reached that time, in my opinion. Uh, I, I thought that uh, I spent most of my life searching for answers and anything I really got wouldn't be all that useful. Uh, so I had to really think hard at what I could offer you. Um, but I, I thought for a moment and I said, well, I've had many unique experiences and I, I've met lots of fascinating people and I've done a bit of traveling and maybe I could offer a gem of knowledge, a, a kernel of truth, a, a glint of recognition concerning a life lesson or observation that you can take with you um, as you start this another important step in your lives. So I, I sort of sat down and I wrote down all little gems of knowledge that maybe would be really interesting. And I came up with about 160. <laughs> and I, I, I whittled it down to 60. And I whittled it down last night to about eight. And uh, I'll talk about six tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and some of them were really cool. One was don't eat yellow snow. You know, that would, that would be an obvious one. Um, when you choose a dentist, make sure you don't choose the fifth one that recommends sugar gum, okay? Um, you know, things like that. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll put those ones aside. And I had a very strange bit of inspiration, a, an unusual inspiration, and that is a guy named Warren Zevon. I don't know if anybody even knows who this guy is. I've entitled my address, Enjoy Every Sandwich. And not for reasons that you think. Uh, it's not because I weigh 250 pounds and I do look like I enjoy a sandwich or two. Okay, I, I realize that. The, the, the line comes from um, uh, this offhand sarcastic remark that I saw on television from a dying rock singer. I'll have to explain for a second. Uh, there are many of you that may have not have heard of Warren Zevon. He was a, a pretty well-respected singer-songwriter in the United States. He died last year of cancer. Unfortunately, he, um, he won a Grammy Award uh, after uh, his death. And uh, he was diagnosed with a very rare and devastating lung cancer. And he was only given about three months to live. So what he did, he basically recruited all his friends to record this one last album which became a very popular album in 2003 and had Bruce Springsteen on it and all kinds of really cool people. And uh, at the same time, uh, a video crew was recording the recording process and they were interviewing him and he was getting sort of sick and tired of having a camera in his face all the time. And as a joke, the videographer was asked him a question and said, what message do you want the world to remember you by? And he was having his lunch and he was kind of bugged. So he says, well, enjoy every sandwich. And it was a sarcastic remark. And, but I believe at the same time, unconsciously, it kind of clicked something in me. I, I thought it forced me to kind of look at my life in a different way, to evaluate what's really important. And, I guess what's really important is that sometimes we have to appreciate what's around us right now and that the things that we think are insignificant are the things that really matter. So based on that kind of idea, I wrote down a couple of thoughts for you guys. Some of them are meant to be mildly amusing, others will be really sincere and I hope you know the difference. 
The world is a safer place than you think. Now, if you watch, listen, or read most of the media, you have a sense that the world's a pretty dangerous and hostile place, right? We're bombarded with images and descriptions of murders, abductions, terrorism, natural disasters, pestilence, disease, political turmoil, and unrest. But you know, the reality is otherwise. You have to realize that the media highlights this in order for you to keep watching. We fail to see the wonderful things that happen every single day. We don't recognize that by and large the world is a good place and that people are good. And good things unfortunately are seen as banal or insignificant or unnewsworthy. Remember what the great American Democrat Franklin Roosevelt said during the Second World War when he said that we really have nothing to fear but fear itself. If fear takes away your freedom. When you're scared to go out and you're scared to travel and you're scared to meet new people, that takes something away from our humanity. Don't be scared of the world, because the world is a wonderful place. Resist that fear. Travel. Learn about the world around you. And that leads to my next principle for things I have learned. I come to believe that your personal growth as a person is related to the amount of reading and traveling that you will do in your lifetime. Make an effort to expand your, your direct knowledge of the world around you and also the world in your mind. Read as much as you can. Realize that learning is a lifelong thing. The saddest thing I've ever heard is the person who says, oh good, I don't have to read a book again. Well, when they say that, that's when they basically stop learning and, and stop growing as a person. Uh, I want you to realize, too, that the arts, literature, music, painting, architecture, sculpture, that they, these things exist to make you a better person. Our society needs enlightened brains. We need people to be able to solve our problems. It's one of your responsibilities as an educated person to do what you can with your talents and skills. And you're here to make our lives better. I made a little joke about you having to take care of us at the beginning as we grow old. Well, there's a little bit of truth in that. We're handing kind of a torch to you tonight too. You're one of us now, you gotta deal with the problems, okay? The arts, however, can help you be a better person. Take time to do what you like. We live in a world of immediacy and quick decisions. You know, you wait two minutes for a hamburger and you start complaining today, right? The world seems to be spinning faster. And you all hear the same thing. How many people have said, I don't have any more time. I don't have time. I'm running out of time. Well, it's true that time flies like the wind. And like I say in class, and fruit flies like a banana. But, think about that one. Anyway, time is, seems to be a, a luxury item. Um, so therefore, if that's the case, if we don't have a lot of time, treat it as a special thing. Appreciate the little things in your lives. L look at a rainbow. Stare at the stars at night. Revel in the child's laughter. Bond with your close friends and have a good time and laugh. Have some personal quiet time. Do things you like to do. Take time doing them. The saddest thing I've ever seen is a person who's unhappy with what they're doing in their career and in their life. Don't waste time doing things that make you miserable. Do something about it. I have two more. And these ones are a little bit more personal because based on my personal experience, and it, it dealt, deals with one that I learned through my parents that the status of a person is not based on a person's occupation or how much money they make. And I have to explain that. It seems that my parents were socialists all along and I didn't know. Uh, we, were, we were taught to respect everyone regardless of age, race, belief, gender, or economic circumstances. 
And these ideas were drilled into us at a very early age. And I remember particularly my grandparents, my mother's parents, talking about this, that being, that's being important. My, my grandparents migrated to St. John, New Brunswick in 1919 after the First World War. And they were searching for better employment, better opportunities, and settled in New Brunswick. And they were part of the working poor. And they lived through the Great Depression. And to make ends meet, they set up a boarding house. I, their sense of humanity and their, the simplicity of spirit was something that was admired by anyone who met these people. And many people met them. As a matter of fact, they used to say that the boarding house, almost every islander that went to St. John, New Brunswick on their way to the United States in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s stopped by the Gallants on Drury Lane. And one example was my grandfather one time picked up a homeless man in St. John to clean him up and give him something to eat. And uh, his name was Emery, and he ended up staying for two years. <laughs> that was pretty typical. Of my, of my grandparents and my, my mother's childhood. And this rubbed off to my mother and rubbed off in our family home that somehow being um, hospitality and treating everyone equally was a very important thing. My, my mother often spoke about these kind of events in her lives and tried to instill those values. It was a very social time at home. There was always people. Believe it or not, I was the quiet one in the family. I was constantly amazed in the summertime about the amount of people visiting us. My parents and grandparents were constantly receiving visitors over the summer. They simply loved people, no matter who they were and what they believed in. They really enjoyed young people. My grandmother was a big fan of the Beatles when they came out. You know, she was in her 50s and she enjoyed the Beatles because she thought, well, young people like them and they're really good looking. And you know, uh, she was very open that way, and she passed on a lot of that, that joy of living and the joy of being young and feeling young to the grandchildren. I think my, my friends really enjoyed coming home uh, to our place. It became kind of a hangout uh, because uh, my, my parents and grandparents, they didn't judge young people like a lot of older people did at the time, and so my parents and grandparents were considered kind of cool, so that was nice. Another thing that I would like to end on, and this I think is the point where I get maybe a little serious, and that is I want you to think about this. I think it's really important we acknowledge the people that are your role models, the people who cared for you, whether it's here at school or in your homes. I'll start with school. And I'll tell you something kind of unique. Maybe a lot of people don't know this. This is kind of a neat high school piece of trivia, perhaps. High school teachers, like other primates, <laughs> suffer from a very odd job-related stress. And that is that we often never see the results of our work until many years later. We'll uh, see you on the street. We'll read about you in the provincial court report. Or we'll, you know, we'll find out something about what you're doing and how successful you've become. And at that point, then, we'll know, oh, we did a good job. Okay? But teachers in a high school, we don't get to see the payoff of our efforts until later. And because we're not just teaching curriculum, you know, putting dates on a board or formulas up on a board. I mean, that's one part of it, perhaps. But what we're really doing is we're, we're instilling some values. We're, we're trying to encourage a work ethic, um, develop a good attitude, you know, trying to tap your talents and your best instincts. And we only see the fruits of our labor. This, is the, this day is really as important to teachers as it is for you in many ways. Because it's kind of a recognition that, well, everything turned out OK. But you know, your real role models, the real people that you have to thank, are your parents, your guardians, your caregivers, whichever term would be politically correct at the moment. They have similar kinds of stresses on, 
on your futures, right? They worry and they care. They want you to be happy in whatever in, uh, endeavors that you undertake. I think the best graduation that gift that you can give them this evening is make a point to tell your parents, your guardians, your caregivers how much they mean to you. Tell them that you love them. Sounds really corny, but it means something, right? Tell them that you appreciate everything they've done for you. Tell them that you're okay and that you're going to be okay because they think about that a lot. Tell them that they did a good job. Believe me, these moments are fleeting. We don't have a lot of time. That's the reality. Don't waste any moment to give that gift. It might seem insignificant right now, but these are the times that matter. So you have to learn to savor every joyful moment and don't forget to enjoy every sandwich. Thank you.